Hi, Professor Gassimi here. In this component of the lecture, we will be discussing gradient descent. So to motivate our conversation about gradient descent today, I'd like to take us back to logistic regression, which was a topic we covered earlier in the lecture series. So remember that a logistic regression uh, is just a way of mapping a variable x to a variable y when the relationship between x and y saturates at some point. This is usually the case when the output y, for example, is binary, or when the output y is constrained within some range. Now, the equation that we use to describe a sigmoid is this equation down here. y hat is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus mx plus b in the case of this equation here. Now, you may also recall from the lecture that when we want to optimize for the values of m and b, what we do is we basically take a bunch of data points, x and y, and we plug them into uh, this equation first. So we take all of our x's, we generate a bunch of values of y hat using the logistic regression function. Now we have these y hats. Well, we can come up here to this equation and say, OK, now I've got y hat. I know what the actual value of y is, and I can compute some notion of how well I fit. That's what this cross-entropy loss tells me. Basically, how well do the line that I have explain the data points that existed x and y? Now, x and y are obviously known from the training data, but there's still this question of how do you go about computing the m and the b? Well, one very simple approach would be to try many values of m and b and to just compute the cumulative loss across all that data, right? So for example, I could hold m to be 1, I could hold b to be 1, I could pump all my x values in, get all the y hats, take all the y and y hat pairs and sum up the loss, for example. And I could check that and then I could try it for other values of m and b. So visually, the way that would look is, let's assume we had a data set that looked something like this. This is uh, just a, a Python plot of the same example that we discussed earlier. I've got x here as the number of exclamation mark characters in some example text. And then y here is, for example, the sentiment of the text, where 1 is positive and 0 is negative. And one thing I could try to do is I could iterate over many different values of m and b, right? So in this case, each of the color of the lines corresponds to a different value of b when I hold m to be 1. And what you can see is that as a function of the value of that parameter, the line is shifting around. Now, if I just used my eyeballs, I'd probably say, uh, b equals minus 7 looks about right. I mean, it looks like that red line, the dark one here, is probably the best fit um, for the model given, given these data points that I have here in purple. And so obviously that was just for one value of the parameter, which was, which was b down here. But I might also want to do that instead for b and m. So what I'd need to do is I'd need to create a plot like this and have basically a bunch of grid points where each time I have a given pair of m and b, I'm going to go about computing the loss, which is described by the heat here. Now, just remember that this loss here, bluer, is better, right? Because you want to have less loss. That corresponds to better parameter values. OK, so if I just kind of glance at this map here, um, you can identify the optimal value of m and b. And it's somewhere right around here, right? It looks like this is where it sort of becomes the most dark blue. And, and therefore, the loss is the least. And so I can reverse engineer that the best b value is maybe minus 8.6, and the best m value is 1.16. And I can do that. Well, this is great, right? And there might be a question of, well, why won't you just do this for uh, every number of parameters that could exist in any number of models? And the reason is because we can do this when there's two dimensions, and we're not searching a very large grid. But imagine what happens when we have a larger number of dimensions. Let's say that we have 10 dimensions. Now there's a third axis coming out this way. So we have a cube that we would have to go after. A fourth axis would be a set of cubes, let's say, over time. And then a fifth and sixth and seventh uh, dimension is just adding more and more and more data points, basically, or unique 
settings of the parameters that we would have to look at and explore if we actually wanted to kind of quantify this space and find the optimal point. So it would actually take way too much computation, way too much time to actually optimize the value of the parameters that way. So we need a way to solve this, right? And if we just look at this surface, you might notice that, well, first and foremost, it's kind of pretty, right? And it's pretty because there's a beautiful gradient here, right? So the numbers, for example, very smoothly move from red, like dark red up here. They then change slowly to become this slight yellow hue, and then they slightly change until they become the dark blue. Well, one intuition that you might have is that if we could just maybe follow something about the direction of that gradient, we might be able to arrive at the optimal point. So for example, let's say that we have, um, we start here in this box. If I look at the red uh, to blue, like which direction are we moving to move from the redder part of the block to the bluer part of the block, I would say, I kind of need to move down here. So then I could, I could move to the next block and I could say, okay, now within this block, if I wanted to move from the redder part to the bluer part, uh, I'd also need to continue walking down. And I could just keep sort of performing this process over and over, always trying to figure out which direction is the gradient pointing. And I could always take steps in that direction. And eventually, if I repeated this process, I would, I would arrive at the optimal point for um, my values of M and B. This very simple process is what's referred to as gradient descent. You basically compute the value of a gradient, um, or which is a change in the loss with respect to one of the parameters. That's what you know these, these blocks sort of comparing two of the blocks shows us. And then you just take steps in, in the direction that is going to help you minimize that loss. And if you understand this, then this is really all gradient descent is. Now, obviously, there's some things that you can control when you're doing gradient descent, right? I mean, we were taking blocks that were about this size when we took a step. So we were computing the gradient with our eyes looking at a block about this size. But we could make the block much smaller, correct? We could make it, uh, you know, two by two of the little pixels kind of in that grid. Or we could make it 10 by 10. We could make it much larger. The size of the block that you choose when you want to jump is called the learning rate in the context of gradient descent because it sort of dictates how quickly you sort of you move through this space or the rate at which you learn the optimal value of the parameters. Now you were hopefully able to see in that plot before that you can compute a gradient computationally. So for example, you could take a value of uh, m and you could add, a, uh, for a given value of m, you could add a very sm small number to it. Let's call it epsilon. And then you could see how the loss changes with respect to that. And you could get some information about the gradient in m with respect to the loss. And you could do that completely computationally. Another way that you could do it, of course, is analytically. So you could formally compute the partial derivative of the loss with respect to m. And you could get a closed form, as we see here, that expresses with respect to each of the data points, pairs uh, x, y, and our estimate of y that comes from our sigmoid, what is the change in the loss with respect to m. And so you could then at any, uh, and for any value of m, you could use this equation to go about identifying um, which direction to sort of step 